of, of mental health and uh, of the speaker across the UK um, who come together to uh, challenge stereotypes and improve inclusive inclusion and accessibility, um, which is the highlight of our, our talk today. Um, so with me, I've got Sarah and Holly, um, and in a second, I'll get them to introduce themselves properly. Um, but before we start, I wanted to just tell a bit myself. So I am a disability speaker and campaigner, um, and I live with uh, Timmy the tumour, which is a brain tumour. Um, and as a result, I've had a left-sided weakness. Um, so I help um, the collective talk about what schools, colleges, universities, and other organisations can do to make um, the UK more accessible to students and to people who have a lived experience. Um, and so that's kind of why the what the inspiration for today was about. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat um, and I'll get a chance at the end to um, go through them with Holly and Sarah. Um, if, yeah, so um, losing my words already, great start. Um, so uh, I guess, Sarah, can you start by introducing yourself and what you do? Yes, sure. Hi, everyone. So I'm Sarah um, and I was born um, from the death. And I am currently a freelance disability awareness trainer and also a public speaker on disability and inclusion. Um, so I've just started doing my business. I started in September last year. Um, and previously I uh, worked at EY, which is one of the largest global cancer firms in the world. And um, I worked there as a senior manager. And while I was at EY, I set up a disability network called Ability EY, for people working at EY with disabilities, abilities, long-term health conditions, and so on. So we had over 500 members throughout the UK. Um, and so it was really there that we um, provided disability awareness training and also provided mentoring support to our members. So as part of my um, disability awareness training, I also draw on my experience of running that network while I was at EY. Um, so that's a bit about me. So I hand over to Holly. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, my name's Holly Sutcliffe. I am a late diagnosed autistic human, so I got my diagnosis about 18 months ago. Um, I also have a diagnosis of PTSD, so I was working with mental health um, already and now I work specifically with neurodivergent humans and neurodivergent families because I'm also a parent carer for an autistic and disabled child. Uh, my background is in, in initially was in secondary education. Um, I've worked across the age range from five to 18 in all kinds of different roles in education. I'm a trained yoga teacher. I'm a somatic therapist and I work with mindfulness. So I work as a neurodivergent advocate speaking up for um, all neurodivergency of which mental health diagnoses are included. Um, and I also work with embodiment and yoga practices with families. So very delighted to be here to speak with you all. Sarah, um, so all the questions that we have um, for today's discussion are all geared around um, inclusion and accessibility um, and how people can be allies um, to disabled people. Um, and so the first question is, what do the terms access and inclusion mean to you and how do you navigate a world that isn't accessible to you? So we're going to start with Sarah on that question. Okay, thanks. Um, I think for me, um, the word accessibility and inclusion mean that everyone can be their authentic self, irrespective of their background, um, because they feel included um, in an inclusive workplace or an inclusive social environment. And also that person has for accessibility to enable him or her to function as simply a human being, just like everyone else. Um, and on a personal level, it also means that I can operate on an equal basis as someone who hadn't got my disability, i.e. profound deafness, um, because I feel included and also I have the accessibility that I need. And so, for me, that leads on to not to have to worry about things so much, um, you know, about whether I will feel safe 
or included. So I don't have that heightened level of anxiety all the time. And it also means that having a much wider choice of when, where and how I want to do things um, because things are more accessible to me. So for me, um, having accessibility and inclusion means a much more a level um, playing field um, for people with disabilities because they feel included and also they have the accessibility they need. And Holly, do you, what does it mean to you? I'm answering sort of my brain. Uh, I'm answering about accessibility and inclusion, aren't I? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, so I'm already, my, for me, accessibility and inclusion is all internal, it's about my brain and full disclosure. So I've arrived at today's talk, my daughter is unwell, she's five, she's downstairs, and um, just before the call, the uh, internet fell out so I kind of already arrived at the call in a sense of like in this heightened state or elevated state so my brain is, is not going to be working 100% um, because for me like my disability is mental it's invisible so for me accessibility and inclusion is about um, often about relationships for me personally it's often about relationships it's about um, accommodations being made for perhaps my reactions, my understanding, I need to be simplified. Um, but I also really carry a lot of privilege as an autistic human in that I am, I, I mean, I didn't know until I was 39, 38. So uh, yeah, that it, in the broader scope of for autistic humans, neurodivergent humans, there's a huge layer of um, access, accessibility requirements. For example, like the access to um, speech communication methods for non-verbal autistics is really limiting and um, only 21% of autistic adults are employed so there's a huge barrier to accessibility and inclusion and it's really very individual um, so for me it's a very very multi-layered experience of what it means for me personally I can pass and I can perhaps kind of shoehorn my way into the neurotypical world, even though I find it challenging. Um, but for me, there's a broader scope of uh, things to consider um, before we've even factored in like race, ethnicity, sexuality, gender and everything like that. So, yeah, for me, it's a very, very broad ranging question and that I can only speak to myself for my own challenges. I think a point that you raised that's really important is that inclusion and accessibility is about knowing that everyone's different and we all have of limitations and things that we don't do very well but it's also things that we, we excel at and that we, we are passionate about and it's about society being open to that and open to to us as individuals um so i wonder holly you, you kind of touched upon it there already what's been the impact of inaccessibility to you no, it was really interesting because we were just talking about these questions before today and the thing that really jumped out to me is like it's had a huge impact on me in my career. So I was a secondary school teacher and I was doing really well in my career. I didn't know at the time that I was autistic, but I knew that I had mental health um, diagnoses and um, yeah, I really wanted to go down to part time, um, which of course there was no a single female without any children you know that's not normal for, for one to want to go part-time and and really so for me that kind of accessibility has really impacted my whole life you know in, in the sense of where I find myself I really can't work full-time um I have the mental understanding to work full time but the way that the patriarchal capitalist society is structured like I find it very very difficult to perform in a particular way um, that doesn't mean that I'm any less able I'm actually very 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 capable I mean I always laugh I'm one of the most capable capable people I know in many respects until I'm not and then I really can't so for me that accessibility the lack of flexibility, the lack of accommodation, the lack of understanding around um, and the expectation that everybody performs in a particular way. For me, that's what the impact, the negative impact has on me, because in many respects, like I, I, I kind of have this image of my brain sometimes and it's like slamming against a brick wall. And that might be either like I can't understand something or I'm just 
spent and I just can't do anything. Um, so yeah, for me, it's very much around that individual personal accommodations, which is why I always speak to about those who have different experiences to mine because I can only speak for my experience. Um, but I think that as human beings, we all benefit from a personalized approach. Um, and so I've had, I've crafted out basically a way of life that works for me, which is to work for myself, is to work for home, is to be able to, um, I use yoga and mindfulness to be able to really regulate my nervous system as much as possible to allow me to work as much as possible while knowing that sometimes I'm just like, nah, it's not happening today. Sarah, has, what's been the impact of inaccessibility in, in your life? Um, I think for me, um, you know, the biggest impact of being a mum and to have, um, though um, so it's definitely because I'm lived under this um, isolation disability. Um, so um, I think, you know, for me, the, the biggest challenge or barrier that I face um, in terms of accessibility and inclusion is um, around attitudes and misperceptions that people have towards people with disability. Um, like deafness, so it's a largely misunderstood um, uh, disability, um, and that down to a lack of understanding and awareness, um, and so that can have a, a detrimental mental health impact on on myself. Um, so things like you know, extensive frustration and high level of anxiety. Um, as well as real fatigue, because I'm um, lip reading all day, I'm trying to work out what everyone is saying all the time. Um, and there's also a sense of isolation and loneliness, so death can be quite a lonely um, disability. Um, so all of these sort of mental health impacts um, lie beneath the surface, and I think sometimes people perhaps don't realise that when you have a disability like um, a profound deafness, it isn't just what you see above the surface, but what lies beneath the surface. So, and in most cases, what lies beneath the surface is far more than what you actually see above. And these are sorts of things that we internalise every day on a daily basis, so like the mental health impact. And I think <clears throat> the way we can sort of get, navigate around that is to try and educate people on accessibility and inclusion. Um, and I think people have these sort of um, attitudes and misperceptions towards people with disability because of a lack of understanding and awareness. So they're not deliberately being like this, they just don't have that understanding. So it is about educating people on accessibility and inclusion. But th that can be quite hard because of um, ingrained attitudes and perceptions. So, unfortunately, you know, every day people make choices based on their own perceptions and attitudes and stereotypes. And then that can lead to things like unconscious bias and discrimination, which then turn to you know, preferential treatments of some people and exclusion of others. Um, and alongside that, there can be a closed mindset of what we can do as people with disabilities and what we can't do, and also how we do things. So not focusing on our abilities, but um, rather than what we can't do. So I think you know, to navigate around that, I think it's a case of really you know, um, educating people um, for change and accessibility. But that's quite a hard hill to climb and um, it needs a massive shift in culture. And, um, unfortunately, that can be quite hard work for um, people like myself. They then lead on to um, you know, a bit of a burnout because you are trying to drive that pain. Um, so yeah, it's, it's mostly around mental health impact for me. I think one of the things that we the three of us talked about in preparation to, to today's meeting um, and conversation is um, the social model of disability, which if, any, if anyone listening isn't aware, it's um, a model of disability that says that um, me as a disabled person, I'm disabled by my environment, by the things around me that prevent me from living the life that I want, want to live. 
um, as opposed to the medical model, which is more about focusing on me and treating me to fit into society. Um, there's some really good information online through various different charities that you can look up and you can see what it means for individuals like what Sarah and Holly have already discussed um, in a bit more detail. This is a question to both of you and it's, is it okay to say to someone who's disabled that they're inspiring? So I guess, Sarah, can we start with you? Yeah, I think the my understanding answer to that is no. Um, um, I guess that's a bit of a bugbear for me. Um, and it's what I call um, inspiration porn, if you like. Um, um, my feeling is that we shouldn't have to be brave and inspiring because that implies that we're not just simply human beings like able people. Um, we just want to be able to live life like able people. Um, and it also implies that we are brave um, to navigate around um, inaccessibility, where really the real issue is that we should be removing those barriers um, and improving accessibility. Um, so really, it, for me, it's almost like a cop-out um, response to the difficult issue that actually we should be looking at how we can remove the barriers and make the world more accessible for people with disability, um, rather than just simply say, oh, you're so brave and inspiring, navigating the world that inaccessible. That didn't really hurt. Um, and we, so we should be educating people and improving their awareness around um, uh, you know, accessibility and inclusion so that all of us, um, all people with disability can then live life simply as human beings, like everyone else, on uh, a level playing field. And, and I've always said that it, it's not the disability that makes the life hard, it, it's the barriers that we face on a daily basis, both in the workplace and in society. And so, you know, we shouldn't have to be brave you know, to actually face the barriers. So, um, so no, that's my understanding answer to that question. It's no. <laughs> do you agree? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, for it, basically, my all I've written down was like not by default. No, because I mean, really, I mean, yes, disabled people are capable of being inspiring. Like, you know, I think, you know, as all humans have the capability of doing things that are inspiring. But yeah, I certainly don't think anyone should be classified as inspiring just by living their life you know in a day-to-day -day fashion which I think is sometimes what's um loaded and that and that's a very it can be a very like ableist perspective you know there can be um it's like for many disabled people I, I don't think and I don't think I've had this experience because I'm a white middle class like um intellectually academic student you know so I have competence has been presumed about me my whole life to be honest but I think for many disabled people the experience is a sort of a presumed incompetence um you know in the sense that like so therefore people think they're in inspiring when they reach or achieve quite simplistic things like you say Sarah like you know when they're just living their life you know and they're getting over the barriers of the lack of accommodations and inclusion so yeah well, I think the, that kind of the flip side is often when we call or discuss or refer to disabled people as inspiring it's because we've made a presumption or a judgment about them that they weren't capable of doing mm. the thing that they've achieved when actually they are more than capable of achieving what they've achieved in fact they're that you know this is actually the base level and they're being prevented from achieving much more because of the structures and the lack of support that might be around them for whatever reasons whether that's attitude whether that's financial support whether that's you know social support you know you know there's many many as I said before you know everyone needs different levels of support and different levels of access and I think like um within the autistic community for example there's really outdated and outmoded um ways that that many many autistic people kind of completely disregard the sense of labeling people as being like high functioning or low functioning and because the low functioning autistic people they are being pigeonholed because they maybe don't speak they're non-speaking that they maybe haven't been given you know communication devices so for them you know they might be seen as really inspiring that they've you know managed to communicate a few things using this communication device that they've been given age 20 but you know let's imagine they were given the communication device age four 
you know, and what they could have, you know, what they could have achieved. So I think there's a real, there's a, there's a lot of problematic discourse around, um, you know, disability being inspiring and, and kind of achieving things. And like you say, like you describe it, Sarah, like, you know, inspiration porn, you know, it, it's kind of, um, it's very, very, like the, the dichotomy or the kind of the, the judgments there is kind of for me quite prevalent so yeah I prefer not to be called inspiring for just living and existing and you know doing what I do every day you know if I've done something fantastic and brilliant like yes I, I you know I'll take the compliment but yeah not for my basic functioning no thanks yeah, I think I agree with you, Holly. I think, you know, I think um, we can be inspiring if we actually, um, you know, have done something to um, drive change and really uh, improve things for people. So I would say that would be inspiring. I mean, but to just sort of, like Holly said, just to live on a day-to-day -day basis, navigation around an inaccessible world, and um, to call that to be inspiring, uh, I would have a problem with that because um, that, is, from my perspective, is not really focusing on the real issue of how can we make it more accessible for people like myself. Um, but um, I mean, I don't know how many of you are totally come dancing fans, but you know, obviously we had a deaf contestant called Rose who won the competition. Um, and I would call her inspiring um, just because she really represented the deaf community um, and it, it, she was a great ambassador for our deaf community and really put deafness out there um, and raise awareness of what it's like to be deaf. So that for me is inspiring um, and then something really quite extraordinary um, in actually putting deafness out into millions and millions of homes who, who watched um, Strictly Come Dancing. I think we could have a whole another conversation around language and the way we talk about disabled people. I think that's for another time. Um, but I think mm. the point that you've both raised there is really important is that it's about the situation and the person and getting to know them and understanding what is it you need. Some people need that motivation, that support, but not for doing simple daily tasks that everyone can do or just like, we just we just need the the support to do that um yeah. and i think the example i always give is the paralympic games those are olympians they're competing at the same olympic level and it's para means alongside they're no different from the the able-bodied competitors they're just in a different like a couple of days later competing um but they still have to train the same they have to reach the same level of olympic fitness um and to me i couldn't do that so like yeah. I find them inspiring because they're mm. being advocates for disabled people. They're being advocates for change and for a movement of people to be accepted. Um, and so that kind of, before I move on, um, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and I'll ask them to Sarah and Holly in a minute. And um, we've got one more question before we move on to, to the open audience discussion. Um, so leading on from the, the last question, what actions can people take to become allies that help challenge and change some of the barriers that we've discussed today? So Holly, can I start with you on that one? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I've mentioned it already and I'm gonna come back to it, you know, that really just taking it individually and really, you know, asking, you know, for me, like I can, I can only speak for myself, but yeah, like for me, my disability is invisible. It's completely unseen and I have very specific needs and I know my needs and I've known my needs since I was a young child. And, um, but I didn't know how to express them or, you know, it wasn't that way. So yeah, it's very much for me a case of, you know, entering into dialogue in in, in a one-to-one -one basis you know if it's a colleague or if it's a friend or if it's you know someone that you're employing I think really you can ask the person to become an, an ally and talk with us not at us or for us you know I think that's really important because like you know um I don't know what you know like as a as a female you know there's we, we might talk about being mansplained which does happen um but I think there's you know there's the equivalent of being kind of like disability splained you know is that is somebody tells 
you, you know, what your experience of the world would be or maybe what accommodations you might need um, because you're autistic and they've read a book or something like that. So I think, yeah, it's very much, you know, like engage with us, um, presume competence, presume ability and think about it as like what you can do, not really like how can you, you know, how can this disabled person fit in with what we're doing in the workplace or you know it's like how can we meet them what do they need I mean I was just where I'm just not going to start working with somebody and um he I have worked with him in the past actually but I didn't have my diagnosis and he just in a in the conversation said you know is there anything that you need me to be aware of you know because of your you know because you're autistic and I was like oh no one's ever asked me that you know like you know and I just said actually not really. I said, just explain things really simply to me and um, don't presume that I know things because I can, you know, in terms of business, I, I, it's it's like my brain doesn't kind of understand it very well. So I said, just, you know, please just explain everything to me. And if I, if I get stuck, just re-explain it in a different way. Don't use words like obviously, <laughs> you know, because that's where, you know, they're the barriers that I can come across is that people assume that just by saying things a certain way, I'm going to understand it. And actually I don't. And I learned that from, you know, being a teacher, like when you get, when you're a teacher in a secondary school and you get like a bunch of kids coming in and you've planned a lesson, well, you can say one thing and five kids get it, you know, and then you have to you say it again in a different way and, you know, another 10 get it, you know, and then there's the other 15, you might have to say it another few ways. So I think that really just don't, assume competence but also assume that you need to accommodate for me that's the kind of so it's you know it's you can say like it's a lot of work you know you can think about it that there's a pressure but also think about it on the other on the flip side that you know you've got many 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 people that are excluded from society they're excluded from the workplace they're excluded from social interactions they're excluded physically from environment you know and that's not really you know an acceptable or tolerable way for a modern society to be existing as far as I'm concerned so yeah I really think the onus is on us and I you know include myself in that you know because I do carry so much privilege within my disabled status so I have a lot of work to do around that and um, you know with like dismantling racism and all of these kind of things you know it's not a one-pronged like we can, it's you know I think their title is you know not another tick box you know it's a completely holistic way of looking at the world to like make it more inclusive for everybody um and I think really just for, for speaking from the autistic perspective I think um many autistic people really really struggle socially and the reason that they struggle socially is that we don't understand what holistic people do and we don't understand what you do because it's very confusing because you're not very you can be very indirect and you can be sometimes and we understand that socially that there's a reason for this but you know the more direct we can be the more truthful we can be with each other and one another actually that's the most accommodating thing for people like myself who struggle really socially um, with the world because actually it's a lack of we can't understand you and we get fixated on the why we can't understand you so the more honest and truthful and actually the way so therefore you know living wholeheartedly living from your you know actually being direct being clear about who you are and what you need from people I think can benefit us all not just autistic or disabled people it can you know can benefit the whole of humanity really so you know I think that's probably a nice place to end it. What about you Sarah? Yeah I think you know um, there's lots of things that people can do to help us remove the barriers and make the world more accessible and inclusive I mean, the part of my disability awareness training that I did to corporate, um, you know, we talk about things like, um, you know, inclusive leadership, so making sure that leaders of teams are really um, into it, you know, they really drive that tone, they really believe in the context of an inclusive workplace, because, um, you know, teams look up to their leaders and copy their behaviours and, and cultures. So if you have a team leader that doesn't really believe in it, it's quite hard to create that inclusive workplace. Um, also, about um, it's about having an open mindset so, um, on how we do things. So people with disabilities, they work in a way that best suits their disability. 
there, but myself, you know, there was a certain working style that I adopted while I was working at EY, um, and which enabled me to work effectively with my deafness, um, but still produce that same quality output. And one of the problems I had at the start of my career was working for managers who had their own particularly particular working style and expected the team to follow that same working style. And so it was a bit of a challenge for me because I couldn't work that way because that way would probably involve a lot of audio calls that I couldn't participate in. So I think you know, it would be really helpful if team leaders and employers could be open-minded and understand that there's no one right way of doing things, um, but that people with disability has, have to find the right way of doing work um, which accommodates their disability. Um, Holly talked about workplace adjustment, um, really important to have those in place, um, and a proper process needs to be put in place for workplace adjustment. They're really looking at each person's own individual needs and listen to them and listen to and find out exactly what type of support and um, workplace adjustment they need to enable them to work um, to their best ability. Um, so um, these adjustments need to be reviewed at, um, on a regular basis to make sure that they're still working. Um, and also just looking at our strengths and abilities at work, so, you know, people need to look at what we can do really well with our disability. And there's something that we can do better than able people. Um, they're really just focusing on our abilities and our strengths. And, and we can bring real values to companies and also we can bring a, a different but valuable perspective to the business. They really listen to our perspective um, and um, you know, look at our strengths and abilities. I think generally for me, um, I guess it's, you know, it'd be really helpful if people can perhaps recognise their own privileges as uh, able people. So if you can recognise your own privilege, that will help you become more empathetic and understanding towards people who don't have those privileges. Um, but you need to actually recognise and understand your own privilege before you can do that. Um, so for an, an example, like for myself, you know, if I go somewhere new or travel, or travel on a, a public transport like a train, um, I have to sort of work out whether I'm going to be safe um, am I okay to get there by myself? Um, what backup support do I need? Um, and then so on, because I can't do audio calls. I can't listen to the public announcement on the tannoy. Um, so if there's any delay with the train, I can't hear what they're saying. Um, so I need to put in place certain adjustments at the start to make sure that I'm going to be safe and I'm going to be able to get there on time. So things like making sure that someone's at home, um, also having a fully charged mobile phone, um, for text messages. So these are all sorts of things that we have to think about in terms of our safety, which perhaps someone who doesn't have that disability doesn't need to worry so much about it, um, doesn't have that high sense of anxiety, and that's a privilege. So, um, so it'd be really helpful if people can recognise and understand their own privilege. And I guess the other thing as well is, um, is to just check in on your unconscious bias. So we all you know, have, may do it at some time in our lives, but it's so important to check in on your unconscious bias on a regular basis to, so that you don't end up giving preferential treatment to some people and excludes others. And I think the final point for me is around communication. Um, you know, talk to us, please do try and talk to us. I know some people are afraid of talking to us because they're frightened of what to say or how to say it and they don't want to offend us. But if you don't talk to us, then the lack of communication can have you know, mental health impact. It can lead to exclusion and loneliness and and social isolation, so it becomes a vicious circle. So if you talk to us, 
um, we can educate you um, and it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. Um, we're not gonna slap you on the face if you get it wrong, but we really would appreciate if you can at least try and communicate with us because it's so important um, and that's gonna be the only way that we can increase the awareness and understanding and therefore help um, clean some of the barriers that we face on a daily basis. So, you know, communication is really, really important. And, you know, just to help understand what life is like with a disability. I think the point that you, wrote, you both raised there is, um, it comes from a phrase that was written in a book by James Charlton, which says that uh, nothing about us without us. To make change and to make the the UK and the world a bit more accessible to people who are disabled. It's don't assume, take people on that journey with you, understand what it means for them. As as Holly mentioned earlier, like that's her lived experience and that's Sarah's lived experience that you've heard today, along with mine, and each are unique and individual. And it's impossible to to know how every disabled person feels. But if you ask them and you go with them on that journey, it makes more of a, an impact and mm -hmm. it goes into uh, a quote from the film Patch Adams, which says that if you treat a disease, you win, you lose. But if you treat a person, you'll, I guarantee you win every time. Just treat the person. I think that's the most important thing is that if you treat the individual, you'll make more of an impact, even if you don't understand what it means to be disabled or what it means to live with their diagnosis or their condition, because that's almost an impossible task. But you can just treat them as a person and being disabled is an amazing thing and in a lot of respects like it's given me purpose and given me a, a passion to want to make change and to share my own lived experience and I think the same stands for Holly and Sarah as well um, and we've got a question from Simon in the chat it says um, there seems to be a culture of judgment in society f uh, fueled by perhaps the media so what role does one our education system have to play um, an employment law I don't know who wants to go first. I'll speak to the education system. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, look, I've been a teacher. I mean, I've been a student, but I've been also a teacher and I'm now navigating the mainstream school system as a parent. Um, and there is a lot of loaded perception uh, that I can see that is really, really, really prevalent like within the education system. Um, and you know like I think that I think there's a long to be honest I think there's a long way to go with you know creating that level of acceptance um, so for me like as a parent of an autistic child who has a lot a lot of sensory needs you know I really try to actualize you know and enable my child you know the opportunity to fully express herself and her individual needs and actually that's kind of often in contrary to my personal sensory needs and it kind of you know but you know I kind of acknowledge that that's the best for her you know I want her to be empowered and to really you know be herself and to be celebrated who she is and, and you know it's annoying but you know that's who she is sometimes but what I really notice about school you know is that she goes into that school environment you know she's in reception and she's doing amazingly in the sense that she is really you know her confidence is is way improved she's accessing the education in a far better way than we might have imagined they are putting loads of accommodations in place but she's learning in that school environment that she needs to sit still now for her to sit still that's completely masking you know for the minute you know she doesn't sit still we've got she's watching tv downstairs and she's in a swing and it's you know we've got a swing attached from the ceiling and she's in that swing all the time and the only time she really sits down is when she's listening to like a story or something and she will sit and be quiet the rest of the time she's constantly moving so I think you know you know that very personal kind of example there you know the education system isn't geared up for our neurodivergent humans it isn't geared up for our disabled humans to really be who they are I would also suggest it's not geared up for you know any humans to express you know their individual needs and I say that as a teacher you know and I really miss you know I see you know being an educator as a huge part of my vocation and I totally understand the complexities of meeting everybody's needs you know I've been you know there's a reason I'm not a teacher anymore <laughs> you know like it's very stressful there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of expectations but you know I really I would love to see the world of education 
shift more into kind of a participation framework where people are encouraged I mean you know there's a lot it's you know hierarchical structure that institutions the way that schools are measured and all of this you know it really feeds into that so like another thing that's really important you know is attendance you know and it's because is attendance really important because every child needs to be in there for 98 percent of the time or is it really important because that's one of the ways that schools are measured you know, I would suggest that it's really important because that's the way that schools are measured. And so there's no, you know, room or scope, you know, for, I would personally argue that many children who have sensory needs are better off, you know, on a part-time schedule, you know, or they're better off having, you know, mental health days and things like that, you know, but that's not supported. So um, from my perspective, the world of education has a lot to answer. The world of the media, I can't even go there. I'd be here all day, to be honest. But yeah, that's my <laughs> response. So I hope that's useful. Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to add to that point? Yeah, I think in terms of the culture of judgment, um, I, I guess I can just draw my experience of working in, in the corporate world. So, um, you know, I think the biggest thing I encountered was unconscious bias. So um, you know, working in a firm like EY, it uh, predominantly... Um, white, um, it, it was predominantly male, um, and so it, 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 it's a difficult thing to prove, but you can tell when someone has unconscious bias because rightly or wrongly, you know, people want to work with people like themselves and, um, and you know, they're more comfortable working with people like themselves, they shy away from awkward situations, um, and, and, and they have the wrong perception sometimes of people with disabilities and you know how well they can work. So certainly when I was starting my career at EY, I had to work doubly hard to prove my ability because of people's perception around my ability as a deaf person. So that was quite hard to ship. So you had to work doubly hard to prove you can do the job just as well as someone who wasn't deaf. Um, and you had to train that perception. And the other thing that I also found at the start of my career was I was labelled as difficult um, because I wasn't someone you know, like them. And so that was quite hard to um, check, you know, to get people thinking differently about me. And the only way I could do that was to work doubly hard to prove my ability. And, um, you know, and so, it is, it is like anything to do with unconscious bias or um, you know, misperceptions and attitude is quite difficult to check because it does require massive change in the way people think about things. Having said that, I mean, towards the end of my career with the world, things started to change. There was a lot more um, openness, there was lack of um, judgment, um, and people became much more aware and open minded. And also, darkness is tracking on the unconscious bias as well. So, it is about breaking the bias um, in, in the workplace. Um, and, you know, things have darkness is pain, but there's still some ways to go. I think, as well, like just from personal experience, like going into a job interview, and there is, there is in the title of today's meaningful conversation, like often disability can be seen as just a tick box exercise like if their person has a disability or is disabled and discloses that they are considered for an interview if they meet the basic criteria in a lot of situations because it's quota it's it's showing that they're mm -hmm. they're engaging with with the disabled community and disabled applicants and not just discarding their application entirely and in a way that's positive discrimination because it's it's not actually seeing them as an individual who has attributes that can make that job and fulfill that job in on all the different levels. And often it's about making like, if, if it's not essential that someone has to have a driving license, don't include it in the, in the application form. There's been so many job applications that I've seen um, and I'm automatically excluded because it says a driving license is essential, even though you don't need to be able to drive every day of the week or what you know what i mean there's things like that that people can do that makes it a bit more accessible to everyone and not just um disabled people but everyone in, 
in, in entirely. We've got a question from James. Um, he says, I was once asked if I could get rid of my disability uh, completely, would I? Initially, his thoughts were yes, but now I'm not sure. What do you guys think about this? If you could so, get rid of it. So can you repeat that question, sorry? So he said that um, if he, he was asked if he could get rid of his disability, would he? Um, and initially he thought yes, but um, now he's not sure. So I guess the question is, what do you think about the question, would you get rid of your disability? What, get rid of my disability? Yeah. No. I mean, so for me personally, being a deaf person is very much part of my identity, it's who I am, it's part of my personality, and it may be the person I am. Um, I do I wish things was easier for me? Yeah, of course I do. Um, but it goes back to my saying that it's not the disability that makes my life hard, it's the um, barriers that I face on a daily basis, both in the workplace and in society, and that's largely down to attitudes and misperception about deaf people. But me personally, no, I wouldn't want to be any, any anything different because it it colours my whole identity, and my whole personality, and I actually really own my deafness. I'm actually proud to be deaf. Um, you know, I think the deaf community is a group of fantastic people. Um, so, yeah, no, I wouldn't want to get rid of my disability. Do you want to answer that question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd also say no, because, I mean, I've only just got mine in the sense that I only just discovered it. So, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, so grateful to understand like what on earth had been going on for me for the whole of my life uh, because I definitely had fallen into that you know I knew I had PTSD I knew I had anxiety I knew I had depression and and yet you know there was always, and yet like what, why is it still so hard like I've done therapy or, you know I've done all of this and so for me to like discover that I was autistic after having, you know, Googled, like, why is life so hard, you know, many, many times, was for me, like, a massive gift to kind of go, oh, okay, there is this thing about my brain that is different from what's typically expected, and now I can recognise why my, you know, oh, I've got, I've always had, like, an amazing memory, for example, you know, and now I can recognise why my memory is so good and like why my things why things I find so challenging so yeah for me no like I absolutely I wouldn't and I've really there's a real ableist perception so like having a daughter who I mean I recognize the reason I got my my diagnosis was that I realized that Romy um my daughter was autistic and I realized very early on that um she was developing differently to her peers in in certain ways but it was interesting because I was very much, you know, like, oh, I think she might be autistic, you know, she's doing this and that, you know, and, and people were like, oh, no, she's fine, she's fine. I was like, I'm not saying she's not fine. I'm just saying I would like to know if she really is autistic because I'm noticing that she's displaying traits that are associated with being autistic. And I would really like to have that knowledge and that information so that I can help support her. But people were very much like, oh, maybe you just, you know, you don't want a diagnosis, you know, cause you don't want to label her. And that's like, you know, for me to sort of have that ownership of the disability and have that ownership and that understanding for me, it's, it's a supportive thing. It creates community, it creates connection, it creates acceptance and it creates understanding. And, um, you know, I feel, so for me, absolutely not. Like, I mean, I wouldn't change myself. You know, the work I do is all about self-acceptance. You know, when I was a teacher, that's what I used to work with students with, you know, on, on them, you know, beyond the English work that we were doing. So yeah, no, for me, absolutely not. Thank you for raising this question, James, because I think it, it, I think like for me, especially it's changed over time. Like when I was eight or nine and I was in the midst of being in and out of hospital, having uh, operations on my head and stuff, I would entirely have got rid of my disability. I would have, if you'd given me like the opportunity, I would have jumped at it because I hated who I was. I was different from my peers. I was being bullied quite a lot. Um, and I just, I wouldn't have wanted to exist if I had been given the opportunity, but to answer them, ask me that question now, I think it's to get rid of who I am. Like it's, it's not 
the thing that defines me entirely like I'm still Chandy and I still have a life outside of being disabled but it's it's a massive part of who I am and my identity like it's the first thing I tell people about when I meet them because I'm proud of it like I wear my scars and my and my my limp and my walk I walk differently um I should have mentioned that before I said my limp um but those are things I'm proud of because it makes me a bit different and just because I'm different it doesn't make me deficient I think we've got one more we've got um one more question from Sean. Um, it's only after working from home due to COVID that I am now realizing how much energy I was ex expe expending on masking um, in the office and dealing with sensory issues. Now we are heading back to the office. How do you make office life better? So how do we make working, going that shift from working from home to working in an office again, better and more accessible? Yeah, I think, sorry, Holly. No, you go, Sarah. Okay, um, so, okay, yeah, um, I think quite an interesting question for me, really, because I actually found working from home during COVID um, almost impossible. Um, so this was during my career at EY, and um, working from home was really, really difficult for me because um, being a deaf person, we're very visual, and we need to be able to read the room, and we need to be able to um, you know, use body language. So for us, you know, um, you know all, almost all of our communication is body language. Um, so working from home and having English time video calls all day meant that we were losing a, a lot of our communication. Um, so we had to focus really hard on lip reading. And um, if we had about eight or nine video calls which are town anyway. And um, you can imagine by the end of each day, um, I was absolutely shattered. And we spend the evening um, collapse on the sofa trying to recover from it before we go for the next day and doing the same thing again. Um, and actually it led to burnt out for me. So by the time I left you, I was completely and utterly burnt out. So I think now that I'm working for my staff at home on a part-time basis, I'm actually not going back into the office as staff. But I think, you know, for deaf people, if I was still working at EY, I would relish going back to into the office um, just to give myself a break from all these endless video calls, but also to be able to see people and um, use body language, use the room, and, um, you know, it's much easier for us if we um, interact with people on a face-to-face -face basis. So um, I think, you know, speaking to my old colleagues at EY, they are now back in the office um, two or three days a week. Um, and um, I would make sure that I was in the office on those days um, because I would never want to work full time, working from home ever again. It was just impossible and um, extremely tiring. Uh, yeah, to speak, I mean, um, Sean, to speak to sort of on a personal level of like things that you could do like yourself. So I don't know if you've noticed, but I've really allowed myself the freedom to stim now, like um, freely, which I would never have done in the workplace. I would never have done it in public before, you know. So I think really allowing yourself to like be embodied, which for, I mean, look at me, I'm just doing this now. I'm swinging on my chair. Um, so I think really like um, on an individual basis, the way that we can make being outside um, easier for us is to kind of reveal that cloak of masking, which takes a lot of inner work because it's quite difficult to be perceived as like weird or, you know, normal, all these judgments that kind of come out. But I think really it's really freeing and really liberating to really navigate the world from an embodied perspective. So I think like on an individual basis, we can do a lot with like mindfulness, embodiment, like yoga, all the kind of things that I do. The reason I work with them with other people is because they, I found them to be so um, liberating and soothing for me and really resourcing. Um, I also think that we, Self-advocacy is really, really important in terms of really identifying what we particularly need and um, 
I'm trying to think of a word between ask and demand, like somewhere in the middle, like, you know, that kind of is going to land fairly well. I can't think, you know, maybe encourage your, you know, peers or your bosses, your peer, you know, to accommodate you to be really clear and succinct about what it is that you need going back into the office, because I think um it's not just disabled people that are gonna you know for, for many 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 people like going back into the world is going to be really problematic in lots of different ways and i think just actually just um asking others for what you need and then you know let's assume that they're going to accommodate you and you know if they don't then that's when you kind of work around that i think um because i think that we all masking is like exhausting and like you know Sarah speaks to the same you know in terms of you know being deaf and having the kind of emotional mental impact of just having to lip read all the time you know that's the same kind of process that autistic people go through in terms of reading the social environment so I think any way that we just allow ourselves a way to navigate from our what we actually need and if that is me just twitching and tapping as I'm talking then you know that's it that's what that's what I do and you know and I think the more we do that on an individual basis it can be challenging to do that but the more we do that the you know the the acceptance will increase um by default so I hope that was useful final minutes before we close today's meaningful conversation I just think to add um that there is legislation to that protects people with disabilities um, and who, those who are disabled so they have to make reasonable adjustments for you um, so just be mindful of that and if they're not tell them that they're doing the wrong thing because they're excluding you and they're not they're not making the workplace accessible for you um, and we've got a couple of comments just to close so we've had one from James saying uh, thank you panel for your time today he feels like he's it's such an important role to change the world from judgment and uh, closed, uh, sorry, uh, and closed um, and making it more accessible and open. Um, and we've got one from Casper, which says that your ability is not something to be ashamed of and makes you who you are. The world is a diverse place and wonderful thing. And if we all, if we're all the same, the world is such a boring place. Um, mm. And I think that's a, a great note to end on. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope you've you've been able to take something away um, and I hope you've answered all of your questions and thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.